Um, is anyone new today that hasn't been the last couple of days? You are? Okay. A few people are new, actually. Okay. Well, just for those who haven't heard it, this is Dr. Richmond Lowe, um, a former classmate of mine when I was a student, like you guys, we, when we both were, about, uh, uh, some time ago. I'd say a long time, um, but... Yeah, very long time. Okay. And uh, so he's had an extremely unusual career path. He's um, discovered something really exciting and different to do uh, as a vet, and that's be a fish vet, and that, that uh, can be a lot more exciting than, than it may initially sound, uh, as he's been showing us the last couple of days. And so his career, he went to uh, Tasmania and became um, a pathologist working for the... A fish pathologist working for the state... Uh, veterinary pathology lab, helping people with their uh, aquaculture farms, uh, and he did his uh, specialist uh, exams uh, with the Australian College of Veterinary Scientists, that's our specialty college, in aquatic animal health in 2006 in uh, pathology in 2009, so um, you can ask him tricky pathology questions as well as fish questions, and he's also uh, did a master's studying uh, transmission of cancer in Australian devils, which is, um, sorry, Tasmanian devils, which is one of the uh, strange creatures we have down in Tasmania. Uh, there are I don't think we know of any Australian devils, but certainly Tasmanian devils. No. I'm sure we know some Australian devils. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, anyway, so interesting cancer, as I said the other days, because uh, it's actually transmitted by these creatures standing and snarling at one another and biting one another and transmitting cancer cells, I think, directly into the bloodstream. So this, right. this is the way that it infects Just other animals. Transplantation. Transplantation. Yeah. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. So cancers aren't supposed to be infectious. This one is, and that's how it's infectious. So there you go. He's done a master's in that as well. So he's going to give his last lecture on being a fish vet today, and this is actually how you become a fish vet. What uh, courses uh, do you study, and what resources are out there to help you do so? So uh, once again, if you can give a welcome to Dr. Lowe for us, and thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, so today's talk is going to be about um, what sort of things you can do if you want to pursue uh, your interest in aquatic animal health. Um, and I guess it will be mainly uh, directed at fish because that's uh, my area. Uh, but you can also sort of derive uh, there would be equivalents for marine mammals and other things like that. So getting your feet wet, guidance and resources for the developer. So to start off with, we've just got a pop quiz. Um, if you follow my blog every Monday, I have a joke. Um, so it's called Fish Joke for monday -itis. So to take your own body temperature, you stick a thermometer under your tongue. And to take a dog's temperature, you stick it up its bum. <laughs> How do you take the temperature of a fish? A what thermometer? A, a meat thermometer. <laughs> um, in the water, yes, very good. So fish are poikilotherms, so they're reliant on the external temperature uh, to regulate their body temperature. So uh, they've done studies where, for good, sort of for better fish welfare, especially when you're fighting diseases, uh, it's very uh, beneficial to have a temperature gradient that the fish can actually regulate itself. Uh, sort of like us trying to, uh, like us creating a fever when we've got a viral infection, um, so they can actually regulate themselves. Great. So you get a tiny teddy. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, okay, so, ooh, we've got another one. Okay. What did the ray fish say to the shark? Nothing, he just waved. Or is that what I No. Nobody, nobody. Okay, I'm feeling a little flat today. <laughs> and one last one. Why do squid make children laugh? Nobody. Nope. Okay. Because they always have tentacles. <laughs> All right. So, um, so now back to the serious part. Why do we need aquatic veterinarians? Um, there are predictions that by 2030, the year 2030, 62% of seafood is actually going to de be derived from aquaculture. And by 2050, 50% of animal protein is going to come from aquaculture. And for this uh, to happen, it requires 100,000 veterinarians to help increase the food production and security. 
and this is in comparison to uh, beef production. So you can see that there is going to be a strong demand, especially in our careers, uh, for aquatic veterinarians. It may not be so currently, but it's definitely going to be growing, and a lot of universities are looking at that, and they're going to be starting to incorporate more and more aquatic uh, vet education. So how do aquatic veterinarians get their jobs? Um, when things start happening, employers would start to look for those with experience, but as most of you are aware, when you're trying to look for a job, people want people with experience, but how do you get experience when you don't have experience? Um, so what do we actually need? Uh, the WAVMA has identified nine core areas where you need to be very fluent uh, and confident about, and these areas are, you need to know about the aquatic environment and life support systems, so you need to know about your water quality um, and also all the different pumps and plumbing and electricity and currents um, and other things like that. Uh, you need to know about the taxonomy, anatomy and physiology. Uh, so everything that basically you've learned about dogs and cats through your, uh, through your years here, um, you need to have an equivalent amount of learning for aquatic animals. Uh, you need to know about the husbandry and, and about the industries as well. There are lots and lots of different industries, uh, from tuna farming to uh, salmon, abalone, oysters, lobsters, and the list goes on and on. There are a lot of species of aquatic aquaculture species. So um, depending on where you are geographically, depending on its climate, uh, those are the sorts of species that you, uh, that you need to be aware of. You also need to know about the pathobiology and epidemiology, so you need to know about some of the diseases and how the diseases spread, and it's basically basic principles from what you've already learned in your vet course. So if it was, say for example, water quality or environmental toxic issue, uh, you get a lot of fish deaths happen pretty much suddenly, uh, whereas if you've got a bacterial infection, there might be a sort of a, a, a lag phase where you start, uh, start to get more and more deaths. So the same, same sort of things apply in aquatic animal health as they do uh, with um, terrestrial animals. Uh, you also need to be able to run diagnostics and treatments, uh, have some clinical veterinary experience. Um, I think I briefly flashed through some of the sort of surgical procedures um, and diagnostic procedures uh, the other day. Uh, so you need to be fluent and happy with that. Um, and you need to know about public health, zoonotics and seafood safety, uh, legislation, regulations and policies, and also principles of aquatic animal welfare. And if you are able to satisfy all these, uh, what the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association does is that they actually run through your resume and look at your knowledge, skills and experience, and they can award you a, certified, a certificate as a certified aquatic veterinarian. Uh, which you can use as post um once you've graduated. So what is the current veterinary education and training like? At the moment, the veterinary degree um, all over the world, and especially here at Ross, uh, the veterinary degree is really intensive and there's limited flexibility in the curriculum for specialised training. Um, but there are some universities that provide final year electives in aquatics. Um, I've got some stats here for the European uh, countries, about 58% of their schools provide um, specific aquatic um, final year topics and 84% of veterinary schools in North America do that as well. Um, in Australia, we don't really have any that's uh, specialised streaming, uh, but they do incorporate it into wildlife and zoo um, things or into, into their undergraduate lecture. So which are the veterinary schools with an established component? So um, for the seventh semesters people, you might start considering these, these sorts of schools. So we've got the LMU in Munich, uh, the Institute of Aquaculture in Sterling, University of Florida, the Atlantic Veterinary College at UPEI, uh, North Carolina, and Edinburgh and Glasgow. And they're gonna be continuing to be more and more uh, vet schools following suit. And at the moment, um, to get training when your veterinary school is not uh, providing that, uh, you need to get extramural experience. But that becomes quite difficult because very few private practices actually focus entirely on veterinary medicine because at the moment it's still uh, rudimentary. Not a lot of people know that vets can help fish. 
Um, and so even fish clinics and things, probably about maybe 10% of their uh, income would be derived from fish. Um, but there are some that provide uh, mobile services where uh, it's a greater, greater proportion is fish. Uh, fish cases are also intermittent and difficult to schedule. So I've got a lot of people um, emailing me asking if they can do work experience with me, um, but I can't really schedule um, a, sort of a, a time that I would see all the clients. And um, so normally what happens is for the students at Murdoch University, I've got an emailing list uh, that I compile. And any time that I, f I hear of a potential client or a client that's booking with me that, and it gives enough um, time so I can notify the students, they can uh, come along with me and attend those things just an, on an ad hoc basis. Um, so what, how else can you get work experience? Um, so we've talked about trying to get clinical experience, um, but if you're interested in other aspects, you can get experience through academic departments, uh, diagnostic labs, especially fish health laboratories, research facilities and public aquaria. But the trouble with getting work at the public aquarium though is that um, not all public aquaria always employ veterinarians. So even if you get extramural experience there, it's not gonna be accredited um, by the vet school. So uh, it's something that you might have to do on the side um, in addition to what. Um, so what do we actually, what does the WAVMA actually think of the current veterinary education and training? Um, so what we're trying to encourage at the WAVMA is that we want to create everyone that comes out of vet school to have day one competency as just like when you come out of vet school you have day one competency for treating a cat or a dog, a cow or a sheep. Um, but what we believe is that a lot of the undergrad training um, is not sufficient to bring you up to speed unless you have already prior knowledge and you have an intense um, hobby and you've learned a lot of this already. Um, so at the moment we're encouraging a lot of veterinary schools to have student chapters um, and where we can actually start providing very um, subsidized education for all the students. Um, and we also provide a grant. Um, I think I've met one of the students here who's had the grant. Uh, I think they get about a thousand dollars um, from the WAVMA and AVMF program, and they get to maybe sign up with a, one of the um, universities, uh, maybe attend one of their courses that are specific for fish, and what we get back from them is that we, they need to write an article uh, for our um, aquatic journal. There are also residency programs approved by the American College of Zoological Medicine, um, and these are in North Carolina, California, and Florida. What is the finest fish in the ocean? Ah, uh, who, who got that first? Oh, you can both say it at once. Clownfish, very good. Tiny Teddy, for you. Oops. I don't think they're vegan, <laughs> so you can have that one. Okay, so what are the aquatic education and training that's available? We've got specific courses. Um, we've got the Masters of Science in Aquatic Veterinary Studies. Um, so I, I'll circulate um, this PowerPoint to Andrew and who can um, circulate to you because there's all these um, links and everything you want to make sure you get it all correct. Um, so I think that the University of Stirling is the longest um, course that's been running. Um, and it's the most prestigious, I would say. Um, there is also CVET, um, so that's done out of Gainesville, University of Florida, um, and it covers all the clinical aspects of captive and wild aquatic megafauna and fishes. Um, so they've got people like um, Mike Walsh, who talks about all the mammal stuff. He will use to work at SeaWorld a lot. And you've also got Roy Yanong and Tom Walczak and all those other people um, who are, you probably read, have, you've read, you found their, their names before. Um, and then you've got um, Aquavet, which actually now there are three different levels. So we've got Aquavet 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and that's a joint program by University of Cornell and University of Pennsylvania. Um, the Aquavet 1 and 2 are held at Rhode Island. 
uh, at the university up there. And Aquavet 1 is a four-week course, um, and it covers everything uh, from the ground up, so biology, water quality, life cycles, anatomy, uh, medicine, pathology of everything from corals to um, mollusks, crustaceans, fish, larger fish, and maybe dolphins. Um, I didn't, and a little bit of pathology, um, and they also get to do some necropsies on there. And that was, I think that's a really, really, really good course if you can afford the four weeks uh, time off. Um, Aquabet 2 is a, basically it's purely histopathology. You're sitting in front of a microscope the whole time um, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. plus. <laughs> but everyone's doing it and everyone's having a great time because we like all the pretty colors down the microscope. Um, and that covers all the pathology that you ever read in textbooks. You actually get glass slides to examine, and that's, um, I haven't seen anywhere that has a facility like that. Uh, so they, they invite a lot of um, sort of specialist people with a, a specialist knowledge in particular diseases or particular species, and they would bring out their sort of uh, teaching set of slides. So everyone has great slides, great, great lesions. <laughs> Um, so that covers everything from uh, corals to cephalopods, fish, and things like that. Uh, but it doesn't cover marine mammals. Uh, but that's more based for either people who are doing a PhD or people who work in a pathology lab. And Aquavet 3, um, I think they do it sort of the Gulf of, of Mexico. Um, I think it's a five-week program, and they cover the clinical aspects of captive aquatic medicine. So they will be dealing with um, turtles, uh, manatees, uh, dolphins, and if you're interested in aquatics uh, in the clinical aspect, um, I would say that that would be the best one that I know of. Um, and to do Aquavet 3, you need to have uh, prerequisite, you have to have done Aquabet 1. Um, there's also Aquamed. I think they run their course every two years. I've not been to that course, so I can't really tell you what it's about. Uh, but I think it's very similar to Aquabet 1. So depending, I guess, on the timing, which one you choose, and also, I guess, prices. Um, the Aquabet prices are actually heavily subsidized by uh, the alumni of Cornell and Pennsylvania. Um, there's also MARVET, which stands for Marine Vet, um, and they concentrate more on marine megafauna, uh, and it's a series of lectures and wet labs, uh, which is equivalent to every, all of these. Um, some may have more practical aspects, some may have more um, sitting behind tables type of thing. Um, and then you've also got the diseases of warm water fish at University of Florida, um, and I think People who have attended this course always ref have their notes. Their notes are probably about that thick, about yeah, 40 centimeters thick. And that is the best reference you can have for aquatic animal health. So um, it's really important like, to keep those notes if you do attend that course. And that one's only run every two years. Uh, so you need to. So I attended Aquabet 2. Um, so what you get to do is you get to line up in lines to take good photos. Uh, they have really fantastic food um, to eat. If you do only the Aquavet 2, you probably get, you miss out on the whole suite of foods um, because the university is not open, so all the kitchens aren't open yet, but you get the self-serve ice cream and good coffee and things like that. Um, you get to do necropsies, so picture on the bottom left is a turtle, um, just practicing on a carcass on how to take blood samples and then eventually opening them up. Uh, you also get to design your shirts. Um, so uh, in our class, two, there were a few designs. Um, two got picked as good t-shirt designs and mine didn't get picked. <laughs> and so they felt really sad, so they, they made a mug out of my one. It's got like nine different aquatic creatures on it. You have to find them. And you get to eat nice lobster. Um, most of you will get to eat nice lobsters. And you also get to pretend to be sea anemones <laughs> behind them. Um, with CVET, I attended that last year. Um, and you get to uh, sort of hang out with cool friends over a beer and meals. 
Uh, you gotta kiss a dolphin, make your girlfriend or boyfriend jealous. Um, you get to prod the manatees and also turtles, and you get to put super glue on a turtle. How cool is that? Okay, so those courses are really great if you can afford it, um, either the time or the money, um, to travel there and to do it. And there's, uh, there's no substitute for it. But if you can't get to there, um, there are online courses available. Um, and the WAVMA, we've just started, uh, rejuvenated our um, web uh, continuing education and professional development. So I'm hoping that more of you will log on uh, and listen to them. Uh, University of Florida has a distance learning online course. Um, when I was there doing Aquabet 2, actually one of the classmates was actually studying this at the same time. So that's super dedication because she wouldn't come out with us to the pub or anything. <laughs> so there's some people even more dedicated than me. Um, and the aquarium vet in Melbourne, um, Rob Jones, he also offers uh, an online course. Um, but of these, I think... Uh, the University of Florida, actually, if you do that course, you'll actually get credit units um, uh, for you, by your university. Uh, it'll be actually recognized. Um, and the WAVMA, we are providing um, continuing education certificates, which then you would have to apply through your veterinary board uh, to um, recognize them. So here are some of the aquatic uh, web CEPD uh, sessions that we will be um, holding uh, up to the end of this year. So uh, end of August, we're gonna do a uh, field surgical incision for, uh, of catfish with radio transmitters. So this will be really applicable to vets who want to learn about exploratory laparotomy um, and also for students who are doing research on, on populations of fish. Um, then in September, we're gonna cover dolphin diseases. So we, I mentioned Dr. Nahid Stevens um, the other day. Uh, who's doing a PhD on that, and she's got uh, memberships in veterinary pathology as well. Um, and in October, barramundi diseases, seahorse diseases in November, and fish anesthesia and surgery um, in December. Pop quiz, what do fish yell out when they need help? Nobody won anything? Nope. Okay. Nobody gets a prize. <laughs> Aquatic veterinary qualifications. Um, sometimes uh, just having experience, um, like I, I mentioned before with the guy that was trying to get a job with an aquarium, he had some experience but he didn't have the qualifications, he needed something on paper. And so what other qualifications that you can get um, as a veterinarian? So we've got the WAVMAR, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed recognition of your knowledge, skills, and experience. Um, so there's a form that you fill in, uh, lectures that you've attended, uh, papers you've written, or book chapters, or anything um, that applies. Just write that all in, and there's a certain amount of points accredited to each one, and you need to uh, fulfill all the nine criteria. Uh, the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Sciences has a membership exams which is purely aquatic, so you need to know everything from ornamental fish through to mollusks and aquacultured fish. So you need to know everything that's sort of in captivity type fish, uh, not necessarily sort of um, environmental. Um, the European College have now just um, created a fellowship exams, which would be the highest uh, level of qualifications you can get for aquatic animal health to date. Uh, and it, allows you to have specialist registration um, in quite a few different countries, and it is purely aquatic. Um, the American College of Zoological Medicine also have exams, um, but they're more than just aquatic, so they cover your elephants and everything else. So it's very broad in general, um, and I think that that's probably gonna be even harder to get because you need to know so many more things. Um, other than that, uh, so those are exam-based ones. There are also research-based ones. If you don't feel like you like exams, I know I don't like exams anymore. Uh, you can do a PhD, uh, Master's of Philosophy or Honours, uh, which is really research-focused, which is very narrow field, but you will become an expert in that field. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for that because um, the PhD um, 
candidates actually, when, when they complete the course, they actually bring in the most money for the university. So a lot of universities are looking for good students who will complete their PhD. So make sure you choose your um, university um, wisely and also your um, the person that looks after you. Supervisor, that's it. You got a koala. Um, aquatic veterinary qualifications that are pending. So there are some other ones that are coming on board uh, to create their own. That's the American Association of Fish Vets. Uh, they're going to be pushing for their own type of uh, specialist registration. Uh, the South Africans and the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists as well, they're going to be uh, creating a fellowship and we've got one candidate who is actually studying for his uh, fellowship at the moment. What if you don't want to study um, to sit exams or do things that you might fail? <laughs> the threat is scary. You can buy all these books. You don't have to read them. You can just put them on the shelf and then you can refer to them, not just to make them look pretty. So we've got books, um, these are written by vets, for vets, so they're uh, a resource that you can really trust. Uh, and they've started from back in the 90s all the way through to 2014. Uh, so if you're really interested in fish pathology, I think the two books that are a must have would be um, Ferguson's and Roberts. Um, and everything else tends to be more clinical aspects. Um, and this one here, um, which I wrote uh, as part of my fellowship program for attending CVET and also a trip to Hawaii for work and study reasons. Um, so that's available to download for free. Um, can have a look at it uh, from, you can Google for it or it's on my website. Or you can also uh, purchase hard copies at cost price. Uh, but this covers everything from abalone farming through to aquacultured fish, ornamental fish, uh, tropicals, and through to everything that was covered in sea vet, including sharks, turtles, and dolphins, and whales. But the whale... Okay, so f another joke. So in the movie Finding Nemo, Dory could speak whale. <laughs> What is Dory's native language? I was inspired this, uh, with this joke. I got it when I was flying to Prague uh, through Finland. Uh, great. Okay, nobody gets anything. So where do aquatic vets actually work? Uh, few vets work full-time in aquatics, as I mentioned earlier, but I think that as jobs become open, uh, more and more we'll be finding full-time work in aquatics. Actually, in Tasmania, there are two major uh, salmon um, aquaculture companies, and they are looking for full-time veterinarians. Um, that's one that's looking for one with experience, and the other is looking for somebody with experience and also another new graduate that they can train up. Um, because what they found is they, they couldn't find anyone with experience. So they've decided that they need to take in an intern and then train them up within the company. Um, so if you're in small animal clinic, uh, you might be close to an aquaculture farm, you could extend your services to inc incorporate them, or you might start to approach um, aquarium shops and maybe marine parks, uh, zoos, wildlife, and maybe museums. And you can also work with laboratories, but usually they employ people full time, so um, if you have your skill in veterinary pathology, uh, that would be your way in. So in terms of professional aquatic associations, we've got quite a number um, and the list will be growing. Um, so we've got our global one, which is the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. We've got, um, since its uh, inception in 2006, we've had, I think more than five or 600 uh, members have joined us and over from over 35 different countries. Um, there's the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists, but the only way to join them is to actually pass one of the chapter exams 
Um, and then after that, you can tick boxes and pay money to the different chapters to join. Um, there's the American Association of Fish Vets, which is the newest um, professional aquatic association. And they are basically concentrating on what happens in the US. So um, there's probably more, um, more relevance if you're working in, in the US only. There's also the Fish Vet Society, which is probably one of the oldest running fish veterinary society, and they're based in the UK. Um, then there's the European Association of Fish Pathologists. So these are not, um, not restricted to only veterinarians, and as you can see from that, it is because that a lot of veterinarians never actually got into the game. Um, there are a lot of other scientists who got into the game before vets, and so um, a lot of job titles for pathology, they tend to call them fish pathologists rather than veterinary fish pathologists. Um, so, but that's a worthwhile um, place to join if you are working in pathology. There's also the Asian Fisheries Society. Again, that's not restricted to veterinarians only, um, and it includes everyone from farm uh, managers uh, through to vets and service providers. There are a lot of professional associations that support aquatics um, in, in their own um, umbrella. So we've got the AVMA, we've got VIN, VIN, uh, WVA, WASAVA, FVE, NAVC, and the FAVA. Um, with, the, with FAVA, um, they're actually holding a conference in Singapore in, this, in November slash December. Uh, in which we will be having a full day of fish topics and uh, also a full day of uh, fish wet workshops as well. So if you are in the area, um, make sure you... So where else can you get experience from life? So this are the essential equipment that I first started off when I started fish vetting. Um, so you need a microscope. I didn't have much money at that stage. I got a donated one that came in a heavy wooden box, which was pretty much ancient, it should belong in a, a museum. It looks like a Canon, Andrew. <laughs> yes, it's black and it's rusty, but it works. Uh, a traveling toolkit, water test kit, aquarium, esky, um, and a watering can, and a subwoofer, definitely. You have to do laps, plus you can never find the address, so you need to <laughs> do, yeah, do your laps. Okay, so what does it take? So you need to get experience. So sometimes you can't get experience, you need to create your, ex your own experience. So you need to go and visit um, fish shops or whatever it is, or start keeping your own fish. Uh, you need to have maybe some training and qualifications, so you can attend those courses that I, I mentioned, or maybe finish up your semest last final semester at a uni an accredited university that uh, has those uh, aquatic um, Subjects that you can choose. Um, you need to be really persistent. Um, and Andrew is really persistent, though, to get me to jump off Black Rocks today, but he's not going to work. <laughs> um, and you need to have be willing to move because aquatic jobs are few and far between. So um, you need, yeah, you need to be able to move. Um, you need to create networks. So if you join up with those different societies, um, then you can start building your networks. Um, and if you can create a Wild My Student chapter here, you can even boost that network even more. And you need to specialize in an area of veterinary science that, and bring that with you. So as mentioned yesterday, uh, you may be interested in toxicology or epidem uh, or pathology, and that's your sort of foot in the door. And, and that's the specialist area that you can... So that completes, um, oh no, that doesn't complete the WAVMA. Um, so I'll probably complete this talk here, but if you've got, do you have any questions?